thing I'm going to address is what's going on at the border. And as I mentioned before, this is another topic that the press underreports. Uh, earlier this week, one more time, we had the information come out on the number of people who are uh, number of people who came across the border in August, over 140,000. It varies from month to month between 140 and 180,000 people cross, crossing the border, but that is just totally inappropriate. It makes a mockery of our immigration laws to people who are doing it right. We know that some of these people who after all had to break the law to come here are gonna be disproportionately in a situation in which they have to take advantage of the public benefits of this country. Um, and it's, we don't know whether they have been adequately uh, blended into America, think like Americans, think the self-reliance that Americans should have. Uh, and I don't think any serious country believes in open borders, except for we do here. Um, in addition to the obvious problem with even letting adults here, we have, depending on the month, about 10,000 unaccompanied minors coming here to be dropped off, presumably at relatives, uh, somebody or other. I don't know where the press is that's always worried about broken families when our open borders results in nine or 10,000 people who at least claim to be minors without a parent around. Uh, the next problem, a humanitarian problem, when you have such a huge number of people crossing the border, people die coming over from the border. The last time I was down on the border, they found two bodies of people around San Diego in the Pacific Ocean. We were told it was more common to find bodies on the Mexican side of the border. We hear about people dehydrating to death in the Arizona desert. Uh, we hear about people drowning in the Rio Grande. But nevertheless, these things are not talked about. They're but an, an inevitable consequence of sending the message to people all around the globe that we don't care what happens at the border. Um, another problem is, depending on the person, they frequently are charged $5,000, $10,000, $20,000 dollars to come here. Who is benefiting by this? Every time I've been down at the border, the, the Border Patrol believes that the people at the border, um, that the the uh, uh, the drug cartels are making are right now making more money smuggling people across the border than they do selling drugs. So, what is the effect of the drug cartels making more money? It gives them even more of a stranglehold on our southern neighbor, Mexico, which is quickly becoming more and more of a narco state. I think part of that is our fault in America for having too many people consume drugs that are snuck in across the southern border, but some of the fault has to, also has to lie in this open door policy pursued, pursued by the Biden administration as the Mexican drug cartels get wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. Um, other thing to point out is we are not um, inappropriate otherwise as far as letting people in this country. Depending on the year, we have over 800,000 new people sworn in as American citizens. That's certainly very generous, particularly when compared to other countries. Um, meanwhile, we have a situation in which we are encouraging people to come here. Right now, 65% of the burst of illegal immigrants are people on Medicaid, which would indicate that it is a still greater burden on our, our budget to have more people come here. Uh, the American Medical Association points out the huge number of illegals who show up at emergency rooms. Of course, they as a practical matter aren't charged for this. It's something passed through to the other people who are paying for their medical care. But again, we have to say one of the reasons for the spiraling cost of medical care in this country is people who show up at the emergency rooms and don't pay, that would be illegals. I recently talked to someone who operates a free clinic in my district, and they told me that a significant number of the people who they deal with at the free clinic are people here illegally. Um, this could become even greater if eventually President Biden gets his dream 
could very easily happen if uh, the elections go away, I don't want to have it go, in which we give Pell Grants to people who come here illegally, which results in close to a free college education that the American middle class doesn't get, but apparently an inducement to have more people come here. We're going to give Pell Grants to people who come here illegally. I hope that the uh, American press corps pays more attention to the numbers introduced earlier this week as far as the number of people who came here illegally. In August, it should be a banner headline. It will have a permanent change in America whenever uh, over 150,000 people come here. And I should point out that as more people come here, it doesn't mean we are kicking out more people who break our laws. At the same time more people come here, about we are, we are deporting only about as quarter the number of people who President Trump was deporting for breaking crime. So we're, in essence, allowing more people who are criminally prone to come into this country. The speaker's announced policy of January 4, 2021. The chair now recognizes a gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grotham, for 30 minutes. First of all, just so you all know, you don't have to worry about waiting 30 minutes. It's not going to be that long. I'd like to talk about some issues tonight that I don't feel have been adequately addressed uh, in this forum. Uh, the press, not the people back home, but the press keeps trying to make a big deal out of January 6th. When I go home, as I'm sure all my colleagues go home, you know, 80% of the comments deal with inflation and insofar as other things are being dealt with, it is not January 6th. Nevertheless, there is something that bothers me. Since we are apparently going to have these hearings on January 6th, Everything ought to be able to come out. And if I was on that committee, the first thing I would ask for is all the video from the Capitol that day be released. It seems to me if people genuinely want to know what's going on, that is where I would start. Therefore, on last October 5th, myself, Congressman Norman, and Congress, uh, Congressman Gohmert ask for all the video from the Capitol to be released that day. It doesn't seem that much re uh, difficult of a request. There were many people still being held in jail, and the press ke kept trying to rile up the population and let them believe something horrible had happened. I received inquiries from both Republican and Democrat constituents who felt it would be a good idea if we released the video from what was going on that day. It would be helpful if Congresswoman Liz Cheney or Adam Kinzinger also weighed in saying all that video should be released. But for whatever reason, it hasn't been released. So one more time, Congressman Norman, Congressman Norman Gomert and myself have had to make a request of the Justice Department to release these videos. It's getting to the point where no longer is just an innocent inquiry because a few people ask for it. People begin to think that the Justice Department must be must Justice Department must be hiding something. So one more time, we make the request. The request should be made by the Capitol Press Corps. There was a time where press in this country, one of their goals, was to get behind the curtain in front of government and expose what was really going on. And both conservative and liberal journalists would have quickly asked for these videos for whatever reason. They haven't asked for them. I again asked the Department of Justice to release them, but above all, because I don't think the Justice Department apparently cares what Congressman Norman Gohmert or Grothman say, but the press in this country that seems obsessed with January 6th ought to demand that the Justice Department release these videos. After all, it's been 16 months 17 months after this took place, it's, it's eight, 18 months after this took place, it is high time 
we found out what was going on there, and every day that goes forward in which the video is not released, I think the American public, the small amount that's paying attention, is going to be more convinced that somebody is hiding something. Now, I don't want to accuse anybody of anything. I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist. But my constituents are wondering, when I, when I write that letter, why are we sitting on the video if it's so important to find out what really went on that day? Please, Department of Justice, release the hidden videos. And please, comatose American press corps, ask that the videos be released. I have spoken from this microphone many times, this biennium, about a tilt towards a totalitarian sort of government that we see going on. Uh, and by totalitarian, I mean the worst type of totalitarian, a Marxist totalitarian government. We see a variety of danger signs on the horizon. We began this session with um, people being sworn in who, in order to get elected, got help from Black Lives Matter, a group whose founders made no bones about the fact that they were Marxist and made no bones about the fact that they were against the traditional American family, that what they described as the Western uh, nuclear family. We have then seen uh, online media giants suppress free speech. Now, I suppose you could say they're private companies, and I suppose you could say it's their right to suppress free speech or prevent you from Googling something, from getting a cross-section of views that are out there. Nevertheless, we know as a practical matter they have almost a monopoly in this country, and it's concerning that these, um, that these companies, which have as a practical matter monopolies, have decided to suppress certain speech. They certainly have the heart of the totalitarian atheist. The next thing we look at is a growing percentage of the gross national product no longer being spent by the people who earn the money, but being spent by the government, by the politicians in Washington. That's another danger sign. We see a president openly talking about taking away the freedom to defend yourself. He wants the only guns to be uh, owned by government, uh, government employees. He doesn't want the right of defense to rest with the individual. This would be another trait of a government very different from that which our forefathers anticipated. We saw an effort made to have our government deny visas or deny property to foreigners if they engaged in suppression of human, of, of human rights. But the human rights that we know the Biden administration meant were not fear of murder or robbery or something. The human rights were aimed at the field of pro-life so that politicians or other people abroad who fought for pro-life issues or issues with regard to so-called gay rights, if you weren't on the right side. The Biden administration wanted to threaten foreign officials with uh, taking away their right for a visa in this country, taking away their right to travel, as well as taking away their property in this country. Does that sound like kind of a dangerous thing? America had better wake up. We are going the wrong way. John Adams said, our constitution is made for a moral and religious people and is totally unfit for any other kind. When you listen to the things that have been going on in this country, what do you think? Aren't we headed for a very different country than the moral and religious country that is required to keep our country going? There are other things that kind of just amaze me. You know, last month, of course, June Dairy Month, being from Wisconsin, everybody in Wisconsin knows June is Dairy Month. But for some people around Washington, they don't think primarily of Dairy Month. They call it Pride Month, and the U.S. flies the gay flag in the Vatican, as well as many other countries around the world. 
Do you think our forefathers would have anticipated, particularly given all the blessings our country has been given, that we would decide to fly our flag with a, sec in essence, a sexual preference flag all, all around the world? Again, highly questionable. And then we have another step in a very unusual direction for a country that was supposed to be a moral and religious country. We are sending out grants to, or requests for grants um, from nonprofits around the world to promote humanism and atheism. Isn't that kind of unusual? Here we're such a blessed country, and what do we do with our money? Why we say, does anybody around the world want to promote atheism? As recently as the 1960s in this country, only 2% of the people said they did not believe in God. Only 2% in the 1960s. Look how far down we've gone. Now we elect a government and we're asking for grants to be given to organizations to promote atheism in our name. I mean, when you look at the State Department, I guess the two things that they will tell people abroad if you want to be like the United States, if you want to follow in its, its footsteps, follow the pride flag and follow atheism. Very, very disappointing. I think it's time that the clergy and the people of America wake up. I know we're just supposed to talk about inflation, and of course inflation is bad, and of course this bad inflation was caused by excessive government spending. That's all true. But there are other issues that are going on out there as well, and I am very afraid, given how quickly we've gone downhill the last 40 or 20 or 10 years, where we are going to wind up in another 10 or 20 or 30 years if this sorts of activity continues um, to come from our government in Washington. Well, we took our two-week break. Um, we hit 100 murders a year in the city of Milwaukee. If that happens in the second half of the year, we are going to wind up hitting the all-time record number of murders in Milwaukee, a city that is directly adjacent to my district. We have to ask ourselves, what can we do to reduce the number of murders? Part of it, I've always felt, is the decline in the traditional family. We've spoken again from this microphone the degree to which our welfare programs seem conditioned upon either not working or, above all, make sure if you have children you don't have them in wedlock because if you have a, um, a two-earner household, it's very difficult to take advantage of all these grants. So this is where some of it comes from. But some of it also comes from kind of the neutering of the police corps by having irresponsible politicians calling police in general racist. When you call all the police racist, which I don't think there are, you create a chilling influence and police, particularly in big cities with high crime rates, where it be more important they engage the citizenry anywhere than anywhere else, the police back off. And when they back off, you have something that was almost unbelievable to see, a hundred murders in the first half of the year in the city of Milwaukee. By the way, I, I was born in the city of Milwaukee, and as recently as the early 70s, Milwaukee had the lowest murder rate of the 20 biggest cities in the country. So Milwaukee, I was always proud uh, how safe it was, and now we're kind of going the opposite way quickly, and at least I believe one of those reasons is the um, certain politicians, it has become politically expedient for them to trash the police departments, to therefore threaten individual police with lawsuits, and therefore resulting in police not engaging the population enough and resulting in a high number of murders. I therefore call upon all of our politicians to boldly speak out in favor of the police and boldly describe to the population as a whole that we do not have a racist country, um, which is something else which should be pointed out. In my own district, I talked to Hmong, who came here not even knowing the language. Uh, if you talk to the Hmong, all of their children, their grandchildren, doing fantastically well, living the American dream. I know an increasing number of people from India in my district, 
Another example of a group that frequently came to America, didn't know the native language, now they're living in the American dream, but for some reason, I personally believe they're trying to destroy America, for some reason, politicians are out there talking about what a horrible racist country they have. I think they do it to divide America and weaken America, but I beg them to start, stop doing it that way and to win elections based on issues, not on name calling and not on teaching our young people that we have a horrible racist country. Thank you. And I guess for the benefit of all the people listening tonight, I'll give back the remainder of my time. I'd like to thank the gentleman from yielding. Um, I rise today in strong opposition of H.R. Uh, 4176. This horrifying bill would require all federal agencies that collect demographic data to ask Americans about their sexual orientation or, or gender identity. And that goes all the way to including the census, so ultimately can affect every American. I realize the majority party will claim that you don't have to fill out this form. But we all know, as a practical matter, almost all people presented with a form will fill out the whole thing. There are very few people who have the gumption or whatever to say, I refuse to fill out such and such a question. Now, obviously this bill affects adults, and I'm old enough to remember when the gay rights movement was supposed to be about, uh, we're not gonna poke around and see what people are doing in the bedroom. Now we're kind of the opposite direction. We're gonna require everybody uh, to talk about their sexual orientation, which by itself is a little bit offensive. But I'm also gonna focus more about the fact that this bill requires, doesn't require, but asks for responses for people under 18 years of age, which is just almost beyond belief. Um, if a parent gets randomly selected to fill out the National Survey on Children's Health, Democrats want the federal government to ask parents to disclose if their three-year-old son is attracted to boys or girls. That's why I think they should call this Steal Our Children's Childhood Act. Um, when public schools report data to the U.S. Department of Education's Civil Rights Data Collection, schools will ask kindergartners through 12th graders what their sexual orientation or which, which gender they think they are. What exactly are you supposed to respond if you're an eight-year-old child? I mean, what, are they, what are they supposed to do with this question? Johnny, here we have a question for you. I mean, what are you just gonna say? I'm gay because my favorite cartoon character is gray. I'm trans because I like my mother's dress. I don't know, I don't know what they're supposed to do with this question. And I think it's absurd that we would ever expect anybody to ask these questions of a little child. But clearly that is what the majority party wants and we hear about today like people you can tell what they are when they're six years old or five years old. I mean, really beyond belief. Um, and like I said, our corrupt popular culture today, we are told people are identifying as something or other when they're seven or eight years old. Um, so in any event, I think it is obvious to vote no on this bill. I don't know how we got as a country to a place where we are asking seven or eight year olds to declare a sexual preference, but that's where we are today and the majority party thinks it makes perfect sense. Um, they're the Democrats must know this is wrong. Could I? gentleman is recognized uh, for one minute. Yeah, thank you. I guess we can about wrap this up. I want the American public, though, to stop and think where we are today. We are going to pass a bill in which seven or eight or nine-year-olds are supposed to declare a sexual preference. I'll close by saying the clergy of this country should ponder how we got this far and what they want to do about it. Thank you. Recognized for one minute. I listened last night to uh, President Biden's... Uh, press conference and was disappointed that he felt the Republicans did not want to work with them. I would like to open the door, first of all, to working together to balance the budget. We don't consider it uh, a goal of ours to race to get to $30 trillion in debt. So please, Mr. Biden, 
convene a group of Republicans and Democrats. Let's work together to balance the budget. Secondly, Prior to you taking office, it was routine, about 20,000 people a month would cross the border. Now we're over 80,000. I secondly ask that we convene a bipartisan group to get back down to 2,000 people a month to, to cross the border. And finally, uh, at the time President Trump was president, he was given a cocktail in which he cured his, uh, his uh, COVID problem almost immediately. That cocktail should be available to all Americans. I again encourage a joint conference with us to get together and cure the people who get COVID. And finally, Mr. President, stop being so divisive and screaming racism right and left. It does no good for this body to constantly call racism. Thank you. His constituents and for his indulgence. Thank you very much. I'd now like to address several issues today and maybe give it a, a little bit different spin or a little different observations than people are getting from some of the other congressmen. I was glad today to vote to suspend normal trade relations with Russia and hopefully to reduce the number of oil imports we're getting from that country. Every day you cannot help but be touched with the reports from the Ukraine and what is going on to the civilians there. Nevertheless, I'm a little bit concerned of the public statements coming out of Washington and that we, I believe we should all be working to end this war and wind up with a free Ukraine. Nevertheless, to end this war, we will eventually have to get to the bargaining table, and I'm afraid that statements being made by both sides will make it more difficult to reach an end result. And the sooner the war ends, the more lives of Ukrainian troops will be saved, the more lives of Ukrainian civilians will be saved, and quite frankly, more lives of Russian troops will be saved. To negotiate a final deal, both sides must realize or respect that deal and both sides must feel that they came out of the negotiation with something. It scares me, or I, I sure hope we're not in the current position we are right now three or four months from now. So I would encourage all of my colleagues and also the President of the United States, when he makes public statements, to ask himself, or themselves, are we getting closer to ending this war by my statements, or are we not getting closer to ending this war? I sometimes feel, and I suppose politicians always think about politics, but I sometimes think statements are made for political effect rather than reaching the serious goal of ending this conflict. I would also like to follow up on what's going on in the border and the danger that we may soon end Title 42. I think for the future of the United States, the most important thing going on, well, what's going on in the Ukraine is important. The most important thing is what goes on at the border. We all know that around the time President Biden took office, about 20,000 people a month and sometimes well under 20,000 people a month we're crossing the border. For a variety of reasons, the major one, which I think the uh, current administration isn't really thrilled about enforcing our laws, we've gone from having under 20,000 to 80 to 100,000 people a month cross our southern border, people who are not vetted, people who we, in many cases, would not want he people here under any circumstances. There is a danger that in May, that 80 to 100,000 figure is going to jump to 400 or 500,000 people a month. People not being vetted, people coming from all around the globe. I will be there next week. And when you get down there and you talk to the Border Patrol, you'll find people not only coming from Mexico, but more people from Central America, people from the Caribbean, people from South America, people from sub-Saharan Africa, people from Eastern Europe, people from countries that are currently hostile to us, 
being waved through after they get a minimal amount of paperwork. We do not need to increase that to three or four or 500,000 people a month. The last time I was down there, I noticed that there were a lot of photo IDs from people from Central America, South America being thrown away before they checked in. What does that tell you? It means people don't want us to know about their past. They're running away from their past as they enter our country. I remember the statement of John Adams, our constitution is only fit for a moral and religious people. We have to make sure we're getting a moral group of people crossing our southern border, not to mention, we have to make sure we're getting people who respect our laws. We right now let in over, or swear in over 800,000 people from around the world every year. That's fine, they're appropriately vetted. I encourage all citizens to watch as people come here legally and are sworn in. We, our economy cannot accept another 400,000 and we know a given number of these people <coughs> perhaps have a criminal background and are not gonna help our country. Not to mention no country as successful as ours can accept an unlimited number of people. We are not prepared for them. They have not been adequately trained in the way the American ideals, the importance of our Constitution, why we have our Constitution. Furthermore, having been down there, the more people you let in, the more it strengthens the Mexican drug gangs. And those gangs make three or five or nine or 20,000 per person who comes across here. We are strengthening their power. We are making them wealthy. Why would we want to expand the current fiasco south of the border? Last time I was down there, the Border Patrol told me about fights between Mexican and Chinese gangs on our side of the border. How do these people from these gangs get here? They cross the border illegally. Is it helpful for the United States to have open warfare between Chinese and Mexican gangs? That's what we're getting more and more. Our poor, underappreciated Border Patrol. More shots directly at them. And what does the administration do? Rather than strengthen the border, we propose legislation giving them free college. College that American citizens have to go 30 or 40 or $50,000 in debt to get. Rather than hire more Border Patrol to force, enforce the border, we hire more people to investigate the Border Patrol. I'm not sure what psychological problem we have going on here. It's the same psychological problem that looks at, say, a city like Milwaukee that's approaching 200 deaths a year, homicides a year, and saying we have to investigate the police or we have to make it easier to sue the police. That same mindset at the southern border says we have 100,000 people here who shouldn't come here every month. I know what we'll do. We'll hire more people to investigate the Border Patrol and make sure they're not doing anything wrong. They think the Border Patrol is the bad people. Another problem, and I don't know whether this has occurred to President Biden and his advisors, I don't know whether you wanted a war in Ukraine, but I don't believe that war would have started if we wouldn't have had an open borders policy. How do you think countries like Iran or China or Russia make of us in S having an open border and not enforcing our border laws? Normal countries don't do that. They think it's because we have such a weak president who will never do anything. It invites trouble. I have felt for two years that this policy, or a year and a half, that the open borders policy was inviting mischief. And that's what we have now, mischief that I don't believe would have happened had we tried to enforce our border laws. Please, Mr. President, keep Title 42. Fire the Vice President from her position as borders are. That's another problem we have. You put somebody in charge of the border who is almost an international joke. Pardon? Sure. The chair lays before the House an enrolled bill.
HR 6968, an act to prohibit the importation of energy products of the Russian Federation and for other purposes. The gentleman may proceed. Thank you. As mentioned, next week I will go and tour part of the border in San Diego and Yuma. I've been in many other parts in the past, but I go down there to learn more directly from the Border Patrol. As is common from all agencies, you learn a lot more from the people doing the work than the bureaucrats at the top. And I look forward to coming back and reporting whatever grim statistics I gather from talking about the Border Patrol and their suggestions to save our country. I hope all Americans listening and paying attention are contacting their representatives and senators about what's going on on the border. I personally believe one of the reasons that President Biden is threatening to remove Title 42 is because the news is dominated with what's going on in the Ukraine, and now is the time you could get away with really opening the floodgates. But if we're going to save our country, we have to enforce the borders like we would in any normal country. By the way, uh, an excuse for opening Title II is saying that they feel that the COVID is no longer a threat. If you look, over 500 people a day on most days are dying of the COVID. Um, it is still a problem. They right now, or at least as of last time I was down there, they didn't feel they even had the legal ability to test people as to whether or not they had the COVID. So as long as that situation's out there, I beg you to keep Title 42 in, uh, in place. It's bad enough having 80 to 100,000 100, people crossing here every, every month who we have not vetted. The next crisis that I'd like to address today is an ongoing crisis. It's been a problem for, in this country for 50 years, but I think things keep getting worse. And that is the decline in which Black Lives Matter would refer to as the Western traditional family. Again and again, bills are introduced around here to provide benefits, and the traditional nuclear family is let out of those benefits. Be it an increase in the earned income tax credit, be it flooding more money into the low income housing, increases in food share, increases in Pell Grants, increases in child care, all of these programs, a normal, I'd say an average, not normal, an average um, married couple are not eligible for because in the traditional family, usually at least one parent and sometimes two are working. In order for to be eligible to these uh, programs, you have to put yourself in a position in which you're considered in poverty. And if you're in poverty, you're eligible for governmental assistance. I had a woman in my district who had two children who were both $30,000, $40,000 in debt from going to college, complain, why did her sister get free college for her kids, well, her, for, for their kids, while her kids are stuck paying off their debt? She was proud of her children. She was proud they were current on her student loans. But it didn't seem to her right that her niece, who was raised in a non-traditional family, or what you know the Black Lives Matter would consider a traditional family, her niece got free college paid for by the government, whereas her kids had to work to pay off the student loans. I hope in the future, as we dole more money out of this place, we stop discriminating against and show hatred for the traditional family. I will point on that I think over time, more and more Americans are catching on to the idea that materially, they can get benefits that they wouldn't get if they didn't get married. I'll point out some statistics on SNAP benefits. Between 1996 and 2016, a 20-year gap, the number of people on SNAP, and these are both years in which the economy is doing well, so I'm comparing apples to apples, 
the number of people on the SNAP jumped up from about 25,000 to 44,000. Taking those two years, about a 50 to 60 percent increase in the number of people on SNAP. Now we have we have to make sure people can eat, and I realize all people can go through a tough time in their life, or there's some people who may have mental problems or such that makes it very difficult to hold a job. But when you have a 50 to 60 percent increase in 20 years on the number of people who've arranged their life that they're eligible for SNAP. People better wake up, because we are destroying the traditional family in America. And I hope in the future the majority party, as they put together more budgets, or if the Republicans ever get the majority, when they get the majority, that they begin to look at this problem. It's not a new problem that gets press, like a, a surge at the border will get press, or a disaster in, in Kiev will get press. But it's an ongoing problem as we eat away at the traditional nuclear family of this country. And it's being eaten away by the programs that are passed by this Congress. And I hope if the Republicans take control, even though it's not a sexy issue because it's an ongoing issue, I hope they do something about this hatred or discrimination against the traditional family. Now I'll make one more point I make it as much as I can before I leave this podium today. One more time I'm going to talk about vitamin D. In part I'm going to talk about it because there was a, uh, an expert in, in uh, vitamin D who I ran into last night from Maryland who again brought up that he felt he had a cocktail which was about 100% successful in curing people from the COVID if they get it. If any of the speakers' uh, office is paying attention, I'd be happy to give them the name of this individual. Maybe it's something that should be given to the speaker. Um, but the new cocktail, in part, is based on substantial amounts of vitamin D. I, uh, a week and a half ago, I talked to Dr. Dreher of Israel, who commented on the importance of being vitamin D sufficient. In his Israeli study with a small number of people, he found that people who were vitamin D deficient were 11 times as likely to die of COVID if they were hospitalized as people who were not vitamin D deficient. And he was using a very low threshold, 20 nanograms per milliliter. 20 or 10, 11 times more likely to die if you were vitamin D deficient. I don't know what's wrong with our Department of Health on this. I talked to Secretary Becerra. It's something that should have been, the American public should have been educated on uh, 18 months ago. I personally have known nine people who've died of the COVID. I always wonder how many of those would have would still be alive today if they had done half as much to push vitamin D as they did with all the other advertising, pushing masks, pushing social distancing, what have you. But with 500 people dying a day, it's still something that should be publicized. I've written a letter to Secretary Becerra and uh, 14 times less likely to wind up with serious COVID uh, once hospitalized. Among people hospitalized, of the people who didn't have enough vitamin D under 20 nanograms, 25% died. If they had over 20 nanograms, 2.3% died, who wound up hospitalized in Israel. Kind of dramatic numbers, huh? So news you can use. Um, but those are some of the comments or issues of the day that I think the press should be paying attention to. Um, and I'd like to thank the indulgence of the staff for giving us the hour. The gentleman yields back. Yield back. What purpose does a gentleman from Wisconsin seek recognition? 
<laughs> Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Um, for those folks back home and the members of the news media, when we talk about the number of illegal immigrants coming here, they basically come here two ways. Either they check in with the Border Patrol, say that they are going to show up for a hearing eventually to see whether they're a sub appropriate subject for asylum, and then they disappear into America. But at least we know a little bit about them because they check in with the Border Patrol. Of more dangerous is what they call the gotaways, who just run through the many holes of our southern border, and we have no idea who they are. It has recently come out that there were 73, and they are more dangerous because we don't we have know nothing about them. It recently came out that there were 73,000 gotaways who entered the country in November. That is the all-time high. As far as the last two years are concerned, it blew by the old all-time high by 22%. I would hope that our slumbering news media would wake up and do a story about this so the American citizens know what a rapid increase we have of people coming into this country who don't even get the cursory examination that people who come here seeking asylum are. So please, news media, wake up. Thank you. I'd like to speak for a minute. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Well, we use this opportunity to try to wake up our slumbering press corps on another very relevant story uh, related to the southern border. In the last week, it became apparent that in the last month, 73,000 illegal immigrants snuck across the border without touching the Border Patrol. So you understand, when you hear these numbers, 150, 180,000 people crossing every month, most of those people are people that are at least touched by the Border Patrol before they're given a uh, uh, appearance date at which they have to appear before some uh, uh, judicial forum. But there are also people who sneak across the border without being touched by the Border Patrol. We had 70,000 gotaways in November. That is the all-time high, okay, without any perfunctory analysis at all. 73,000. The border crisis is the greatest it's ever been. I beg the press corps in this country to wake up. That 73,000 figure ought to be the banner story in every newspaper across the country. We know that most newspapers won't even cover it. They're off covering the some Hollywood floozy. Thank you. Seek recognition. We have two things. First of all, Ms. Speaker, I would like to remove myself as co-sponsor of H.R. 3807. The gentleman's request is accepted. And now I'd like unanimous consent to make a one-minute Without address. objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. America has to realize we are on the precipice of making one of the most significant presidential uh, determinations in recent memory, and that is the removal of Title 42 affecting, Wisconsin, uh, affecting American immigration law. Already, we are allowing, depending on the month, between 80 and 100,000 people to cross our border who are not appropriately vetted. However, due to a title put in effect by President Trump, we are keeping another perhaps 400,000 people a month, we're told 18,000 a day, south of the border out of concern that they will bring the virus in this country. If this title is removed, we will go, according to current estimates, to 18,000 people a day, a half a million people a month coming in this country. That is an intolerable amount. They are people we cannot support. They are people who have not been appropriately vetted, and obviously it'll be a massive increase in illegal drugs crossing our southern border. I beg the American public to wake up and do what you can to make it clear to everybody in this body that we do not need a massive increase over the already intolerable 80 to 90,000 people who are coming here every month on vetted. The gentleman's Thank you. time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. There is another significant bill that is being held back uh, only because of the filibuster rule in the Senate. And even though this bill passed this session, the average American does not know how close we are to this becoming law. I speak about the LGBTQI Data Inclusion Act. In this act, in this act both for the purposes of censuses and other government forms, American citizens and American children uh, will be asked to declare a sexual preference or special 
or sexual act, be it bisexual, be it binary, be it transgender, what have you. Um, I think this is highly offensive. There was a time where the gay, the gay rights movement meant we weren't supposed to ask what people do in bed. Now it's going to be the government's business, and you're going to be asked to declare uh, your sexual preference, which by itself is outlandish, but just as outlandish as this declaring goes all the way down to kids who are seven or six or five years old. Now there, the form may be filled out by parents or by a teacher. Um, it includes forms other than just the census, forms that school districts are required to fill out. But nevertheless, I think it is a fundamental change in America that we are going to be collecting data on sexual preferences from any age group. Outlandish for age five, outlandish for age 12. But this, to me, fundamental change in the way America operates, uh, in the way we, the, the, the um, information that people are supposed to turn over the government is a fundamental change. I'd be surprised if one out of 300 Americans knew we are so close to making that requirement in the United States. Uh, and I hope that our slumbering press corps, I don't mean to refer to them that way, but I hope that uh, the average American knows how close we are to that bill becoming law. Next issue that I think we ought to look at a little bit concerns the um, continued effort to claim we have a huge racist problem in this country. I do not believe we have a racist problem in the country, and the easiest way to see that is when you look and see how well the immigrants who just come here are able to do, despite the fact that many of the immigrants who come here don't even know English. Um, I have recently spoke to people from the Hmong community, from the Indian community, from the Filipino community, and all of them are so happy to be in America and think America is the land of opportunity, that people do so well in America. I talked to a Hmong individual recently, and he had, between himself, his children, and his siblings' children, you're talking about 30 children or nieces or nephews, every one of them is thriving in America, nobody's broken any laws, they all have decent jobs, they're educated in one fashion or the other. These are people who came here from an entirely different culture, many were not Christian, their parents or grandparents did not know English when they came here, but they thrive in America. I've been talking to some Indian immigrants, and they say how wonderful the opportunity is here. Again, talked to somebody recently, he came here, he didn't know any English, he had to start out as a dishwasher, he worked his way up and is doing fantastically well in America. The fact that he is of Indian heritage had no effect on him whatsoever, and he couldn't think of any way in which he had been discriminated against. Same thing is true with somebody from the Philippines. And, but what do we get here? Out of Washington, we get Joe Biden talking about, we have to pass a bill I'll talk about in a second. Uh, we have to make it easier to sue police, in part because we perceive the police are prejudiced. We continue to promote the Black Lives Matter movement, which is built on the lie that we have a huge problem with racist police in this country. But nevertheless, we coddle them, people give them money, they're treated with respect. Um, in our election law, we are told we have to get rid of photo ID, something that many other countries have, because it's racist to require photo ID. Some horrible slander that Joe Biden has against the people of this country. I would ask that the press begin to treat these claims of racism a little more skeptically. I think they should ask people details when they claim racism is a big problem, uh, because it is not without harm. It, I think, causes people to walk around with a chip on their shoulder. I think that it causes unnecessary divisions in Americans. I think America's been a melting pot, pot my whole life and well before I was born. Um, 
People come here from all around the globe. I should point out that insofar as there are ethnic problems, they are frequently greater in other countries. That's one thing that people from India pointed out to me, that there are problems between different religious groups or ethnic groups in India in which people even get killed. There is nothing like that in the United States, and it's time the politicians of this building, rather than trying to take political advantage uh, of, uh, of the grievances that they try to bring up, they should tell people that anybody who works hard in America has an opportunity to succeed and that, uh, that that is something they can be proud about of America and they can just use their common sense. If you're down at the border, the people who come here, they come here from all around the globe because they know that despite the fact they might not teach, uh, might not know the native language, uh, despite the fact that they don't have a job lined up when they get here, whether you're coming here from Peru or Cuba or Ecuador or Bangladesh, Uzbekistan, anywhere, you're going to be better off in the United States, not Christian, not Nor Northern European, not European at all. Uh, you're still going to be better off in the United States. And as so many immigrants have told me, there is unlimited opportunity in the United States. That's why they're here. And the only way, I, one of the major reasons I think why some people don't succeed in taking, away, taking advantage of that opportunity is because they're told by opportunistic politicians that America is a racist country and you cannot succeed in America. Um, final comment that I think the press should be picking up going into the election cycle, a law that right now has passed the House twice but has only not passed the Senate. Uh, because of the filibuster rule, which could change with a, a shift of just two votes in the U.S. Senate, is the law making it easier to sue police. There are a variety of reasons why crime has gone up so dramatically in this country in the last two years. And there's no question that part of it is we are not adequately funding our police departments, but even more than that, we are um, not speaking positively about police, and now we have a bill out there making it easier to sue police if they handcuff somebody, if they wrestle with somebody. This rhetoric from politicians and, if, and also this proposed law causes police, I think, to be very reluctant to physically engage somebody, very reluctant to be aggressive, and as the result we have in Milwaukee, the city of my birth, and many other urban cities, including Washington and, and Baltimore, right up the freeway, to have dramatic increases in the number of homicides. It didn't just happen. It happened in part because of um, rhetoric from politicians, tearing down police, encouraging lack of respect for the law. And it would uh, the final highlight of this drive to dislike police could easily happen in January when we get rid of the limited immunity that police currently have uh, if they have to engage someone. It would dramatically change policing, make it more difficult to find police, and make it easier to sue police. So I hope our press corps pays special attention to these laws which did not pass out of this Congress but passed only out of the House but if there's a slight shift in the partisan makeup in January, they could easily become law. And the American citizens ought to know about these laws before they go to vote in November. I'm afraid they're not going to know it because they're not adequately covered by our slumbering, our slumbering uh, journalists. So I, I ask one more time that they pay attention to laws related to the racism, laws related to um, suing police, laws related to the Data Inclusion Act, in which we go around and try to collect data on sexual preferences from all Americans, and the PRO Act, in which we, I think, just shamefully uh, tip the balance of the scales towards forcing people to become members of a union. Thank you very much. Does the gentleman yield back? I yield back.
I have seven minutes in the on block, and I'll talk to two issues in general that cover, I think, all of the amendments. The first thing is an overall concern of spending. It's a lot easier to break an economy than to fix an economy. And the American Rescue Plan and the very high spending infrastructure bill between them, spending over, um, over $3 trillion, I think is the primary reason for the huge inflation we're having to deal with today. You look at these underlying uh, bills, uh, the T-HUD bill up 12 percent, financial services and general government up 17 percent. These, these programs have to be held at an even or slight decrease level for years to make up for the damage that was done with those two big bills. And I'm not going to say there wasn't damage done before that. I think a little bit of the uh, COVID bills that were originally uh, signed by the prior president were not exactly the most frugal things either. But everybody knew at this time this was a problem. And my amendments are all on the line of not destroying programs, not taking out programs altogether, but to going back to the, the amount that was spent last year or the amount that was spent in President Biden's, uh, President Obama's final year. And I, I sometimes use President Obama's final year to show I'm not being reckless here. But what I am saying is there ought to be a little bit of restraint in the Appropriations Committee and a little bit of restraint of the new bills coming out. A couple of my amendments also address this obsession with hiring bureaucrats to enforce diversity. America is supposed to be a country in which we view ourselves as individuals. There are people who I think want to destroy America and try to set one group against the other group. When I look at my district, I know a lot of people who are Hmong. I know, I've recently got to know a lot of people are from India. They have had no problem succeeding in America. I know people from Russia. And what they all tell me is the same thing. The easiest place in the world to succeed is America. But there are people who try to divide us and set up programs in which you say, I'm not going to succeed because of who I am. I want to succeed as a group of people determined by where my ancestors were born three or five or ten generations ago. Not only are these pro programs, first of all, a waste of money, we have to have some people administer the programs. We have nowhere near enough people to work in American business as it is. But secondly, they are designed to train people that what goes on in Washington is a fight or a contest between ethnic groups. That is a cancerous way to think. The fact that so many immigrants come here without even being able to speak English and succeed wildly show it is a lie. So I am trying to reduce funding or get rid of funding altogether for some of these programs. Thank you.